All right, we are back with another episode of the Room for Nuance podcast. I am Sean Demars here with Tilly Dillahay. Yeah, that's a fun name. <laughs> that was smart. You had had me say it instead yeah. of trying to say it. That's right. I yeah. only read it, so I wanted to yeah. hear it. Yeah, that's one more right. time. Would you Would you open us in prayer, sister? Ask for the Lord's help. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Father, thank you for this beautiful day in Alabama. Uh, thank you for brothers in Christ, new brothers to meet here today. And I pray that you'd bless our conversation, fill us with your spirit to speak what is true and what is edifying to your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sister, I'm so thankful that we got you here on the podcast <laughs> um, for, for a bunch of different reasons. But the main reason being uh, your book, Broken Bread, I just found to be so helpful, <laughs> so unique, so well written. I mean, I am just being effusive in my praise here, but I mean it and I wouldn't flatter you. Okay. You've written another book on envy. Yes. Which is also very good. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we can have you back for a round two to talk about envy. But today we're going to talk about broken bread, how to stop using food and fear to fill spiritual hunger. But before we get into the book, can we just hear a little bit of, uh, about your story, your testimony? How did you come to, to know the Lord? And then maybe how that led to you writing this book? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I was raised in a Christian homeschooled home, a big family in Nashville area. My dad was in music business, and um, and I I got to be about 16 years old, graduated from high school, went to a local college, and um, just kind of slowly the the rails kind of came off, and I. Um, I developed an eating disorder. I got super depressed. Um, I basically shot out of college when I was about 20 and decided I was an agnostic. And my my parents were wanting to help me so much, but they just really did not know how to help. So they ended up sending me to go stay for a week in the home of a pastor in tiny little Hartsville, Tennessee. He was a biblical counselor and a pastor that we had connections to from when I was a kid. And um, basically he just, he asked me to kind of present my objections to the faith during that week. And I did, and and he was very helpful in those meetings. But I think maybe even more helpful during that couple of weeks was just staying in his home and watching his family, just like a, a faithful Christian family in a small town a faithful, small little church in a small town. Nobody was cool there. Nobody was impressive, but they were just faithful, obedient Christians. And I was, um, I was just, I was ministered to watching the functional family atmosphere out there. And I, I think it was about two weeks in that I said, okay, I'm a Christian. Now what? So I ended up moving there, um, without a job, without any any kind of plan for what was going to happen. I was just going to live in this little town, go to this little church. Different families in the church hosted me, so I stayed with people. And I ended up getting a job as a, a editor of a little newspaper out there. So, And then I met my husband there, and he he was a pastoral intern at the time. And I really thought when I moved there to, that I was going to get away from all the men, basically, mm -hmm. and kind of be be out of that for a while. And and that was true, but there was one single man in the church, and it was him. <laughs> so, so yeah. So we got married a couple of years later, and I've been in Little Hartsville for the last ten or fifteen years, raising kids now. Yeah. So, yeah. That must have been weird to be twenty something, and for your parents to be like, "Hey, we want you to go live in the home of this pastor for a couple." Yeah, weeks. it was. It was weird. Well, what made you agree to it? Desperation, I think. Yeah, I think I just was. I was just kind of like, well, I've tried a lot of things. Um, I haven't tried that yet, but yeah, I mean, they they were genuinely just just trying to help, and I think I knew that. Yeah. So, so you mentioned an eating disorder. Can you kind yeah. of walk us through that a little bit, if you're uh, however much you're comfortable, yeah. and how yeah. that connects to the book? Yeah, yeah, I've written about it in both of the books actually, because um, it was a big deal. So. You know, I was a dieter. I was a I was a very young dieter. I was like 14 years old when I started to diet. And it was because I was trying to be a jazz musician. I was trying to break into the music business. And I was like gaining a little weight. And, and I was told, hey, here's what you need to do. So I did. And 
dieting at a young age is a great way to set the stage for an eating disorder later on. You see that with uh, like gymnasts, wrestlers, people mm. who always have to make weight or be a certain right. size. Yeah, yeah just, but, just yeah, that's right. Especially when it's pressure from a young age. Yeah, so it definitely, you know, it just starts to, I mean, anyone who's dieted knows that it, start, it sets the stage for tastelessness for you kind of divorcing the taste of the food and the the ritual of eating with other people and you start removing the meaning of food and turning it into kind of a math, like a math thing. And anyway, so when I got to college, I, I just, you know, I was 16. I was living in dorms away from my family for the first time without a lot of support. And I just started to eat. And what I just were you ate doing and ate. in college at the age of 16? I just got, I got done with school and I got a, a scholarship to this Christian school in Nashville. And it okay. was like, well, what are you going to do now? I guess I'll do this. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. So you're eating a lot, eating a lot. And, and the freshman five was like freshman 30 yeah. probably for me. So when I started gaining that weight, I was like, okay, the gluttony and the vanity sort of went head to head where I was like, I can't, I can't do this. So I think I read somewhere about throwing up and tried it. You know, I was like 18 or so when that started and that became, I mean, it, it, it got worse. It was definitely up, up through my twenties. That was a problem. So that was a big part of what I was needing help with when I was kind of a wounded bird going out to Hartsville. So, and yeah. how did you kind of get out of that? How did you overcome that? Yeah. I mean, it was, there were a lot of different stages. Um, but one of the big things was learning how to cook and learning how to bring food back into kind of where it belongs in, in a community as part of a, part of a family. So that's been, that's been really big. In fact, when me and me and my husband, when Justin and I were dating, you know, I was still really, really struggling uh, during even part of our dating time. And he, I remember him asking like, what can I do to, what can we, how can we help? You know, what, what can I do to help? And, and I was like, well, sitting down with me to eat a meal that I cooked yeah. is helpful because that's what food is for and it slows you down enough to actually taste and enjoy you know so that was the first step in developing I think kind of what ended up going in some of the things that went into this book just the idea of like gluttony may not be enjoying your food too much it may be enjoying your food too little mm. um so yeah. that was in your early 20s Yes. You're in your late 20s now. I'm in my late 30s. Oh, late 30s. If, okay. if 36 is your late 30s. Yeah. Is it is it possible to really have victory over that stuff? I mean, do you feel like, do you ever think, okay, I got to go throw up? Yeah. I mean, um, it is possible for your life to be completely different because it is just, it's not, it's not, food is not what it was. Like food is a is a joyful and delightful thing. And it's a means of serving people. And it's just not, it's not a fearful ground anymore. And I don't think, I really didn't think that was possible. There's definitely been seasons when I thought, well, and it, but I have to say, I mean, there have been seasons in, even in marriage when, you know, you get drugged back into a place for a little while, for a short season, maybe having babies, you know, it's a lot, it's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, right after, birth you think oh i gotta drop these pounds yeah although it's ironic because after after birth is when it's really easiest right. you know the lactation helps right right okay yeah. i didn't know we were going to talk about lactation today but <laughs> first I'm time glad. i've said lactation on this <laughs> on podcast your, yeah well congratulations yeah let's really explore the space here. yeah yeah <laughs> let's talk more <laughs> all right let's let's get it right into what i think is the most interesting and useful part of your book you you give us the category of four food poles mm-hmm uh, I've been calling them, when I went back and reviewed in preparation for this interview, I realized I've just been calling them the food, the four food sins. Okay. Is that wrong of me to do that? I don't think so. Okay. I mean, well, they're all, they're like there extreme positions. Okay. So they're all, yeah, I mean. Yeah. So the, it's asceticism, mm -hmm. gluttony, snobbery, and apathy. Yes. Yeah. And do those pair up together? Yeah. It's like two alternate continuums like okay. asceticism on the opposite end from gluttony uh -huh. and then snobbery on the opposite end from apathy that's right okay so. we're going to explore each one at length but can you just briefly tell us what each one is yes so asceticism is the fear of pleasure 
It's just a, it's a posture that believes God is as, um, as slow to condone pleasure as we are. Um, as slow oh, to condone it. Okay. That's or, right. or it might be quick that, to condemn that, it. That basically that God is as stingy as we are. That's what we think about him. You know, God's not happy unless we're miserable. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And if it's, if it's too nice, then it's, you know, probably dangerous. So, um, and then I do think that spending a lot of time in gluttony is a great way to get you there because you get, you get this kind of out of control feeling when you live gluttonously and you think, what can I do about this? I'm going to have to set up some rules. And so the stricter the rules you think, the safer you're going to be. And that's usually not how it works. Um, as we know from, you know, the law and, and grace and the gospel. So, um, so yeah, so gluttony is just an inability to stop when it's time to stop, an inability to recognize your limits as a human being and a body that can only eat so much, um, and a failure to recognize the, the seasons and the times and the, the cycles of life, that there's a time to do this and a time to be done and go do the next thing. Um, and we'll talk more about that later, I think. Um, so yeah. Then your other snobbery. two, yeah, snobbery and apathy. So snobbery is using food as a social marker to try to feel more important than other people. And I think, you know, this book came out in 2020, right, right when everybody was locked up at home, I think actually. But that was definitely right after gluten, gluten intolerance kind of had reached a peak, a peak, I think, and had kind of maybe come come back out the other side. I hope so. Yeah, maybe. But, um, you know, I was, I was in the church and I was out in this little town where people are not, we're not on the front end of anything where I live. You know, like I, I find out what people are wearing five years later, maybe when, it, when it comes out to Hartsville. But, um, but with food, even in the church, I was feeling like, wow, I have a lot of friends who are suddenly gluten intolerant. And then a couple of years later, they're not anymore. Or every everybody's taking turns being on different diets, and I just wonder why is it that we are basically behaving the same way as the world? Um, and some of that, I think, is mixed up with the asceticism thing, just that it, it attempts to get control. But I have also seen it used in a very snobbish way, like you show up and you just want to talk about how you're not eating what other people are eating, you know, and it's it's obnoxious, you know. Yeah. But we do it because we're human beings and people have been trying to feel important for as long as we've been around. So, um, And then on the opposite end of that, so if you are caring, you're caring so much, you're using food almost, almost as like a case system. On the opposite end from that would be Sorry, just to be clear, apathy. C-A-S-T-E. C-A-S, case, yes. Yeah, like, like a, sorry, the yeah. cast. Is cast, I yeah. Those. I'm yeah. probably saying it wrong. No, it's okay. Because most of my vo vocabulary comes from reading <laughs> and not from listening to people S talk. Same, same. Okay, okay. so um, as like a, you know, a way of, of arranging yourself hierarchically yeah. with other people. And then on the other end, you have apathy, which is where you were, you're basically saying, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to act that way. So I'm going to pretend like Hungry Man Dinner is just as good as when a lady spends five hours making, you know, a, a beautiful yeah. whatever. So um, just a failure to be grateful for the unbelievable access that we have to flavors and ingredients um, that's unprecedented. Like no one, no other culture has ever lived like we do. So it's really incredible. It is. Yeah. All right. Well, let's walk through these one by one because there's just there's so much goodness to unpack. Okay. So we'll start with asceticism. This may be kind of a strange question to ask, but do you think, do you think we try to find our justification through food? Yes. Care, yeah, and you're care. talking about like spiritual, yeah. moral. Yeah, I, I justification. This, I preached yeah. a sermon recently where I made that as an application point okay. about how we try to mediate our spirituality through all different kinds of things, mm -hmm. including food. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I think the feedback that I got was pretty split. Half of it was, oh, I've never heard that before. Can you tell me more? And mm -hmm. the other half was, oh, I think I do that all the time. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that's kind of a big question to start us off. But mm -hmm. it, this idea that 
you know, like God will be pleased with me. I can stand in his presence. If only I can manage my dinner table well. Yeah. Yes. And it's an, it's an old, it's an old mistake. It's, it's a, it's a mistake that I think Jesus addressed really clearly. And it's not that, that righteousness by food is unheard of in the, you know, in Jewish history. And that's our history as Christians. Um, but I think he dealt with it. He, he made it very clear that food will not commend us to God. And, and yet we still want to erect new food laws that are stricter than the Jews even had to deal with, you know. And I think it is. It's because we're seeking righteousness this way. Um, so, yeah. And the world does this. That's, that's the reason why I think it's, it's really important as Christians to have our heads on straight about this because, because this is the way the world looks at food. It's a, I think I read somewhere someone describing it as like a, a life raft. The world is looking to food to save itself, to, to bring everlasting life. And it can't do that. But, but if a Christian behaves that way, then we're just, we're, we're imitating the world and saying, yeah, maybe food is going to save us. Um, and that's why people get so defensive about their diet of choice is because people, people criticizing how you've chosen to keep yourself alive as long as possible. Someone's poking at your life raft, you know. Is food medicine? Good grief. That's so funny. Me and Justin and I were talking about this this morning because he was, he was trying to rem remind himself of what, what this book is about, you know. And, uh, and he was, I guess he had, maybe he picked up and opened it or something, but um, I was telling him, no, this is a real post from a friend of mine had posted, I'm, I'm struggling with diet. And, and some Christian friends wrote on that on her wall, responded by saying, I just think of food as poison and medicine. There's only two categories of food, poison and medicine. There's nothing in between. Yeah. So just the idea, I mean, that's so loaded. Like, just think about that, that she literally, in order to motivate herself to stay within the walls that she's erected, she's, she's decided the best way to do that is to lie to yourself and separate the entire continuum of food, of health and wellness that yeah. you can find in food to it's going to save you or it's going to kill you. Like that's it. So yeah, it's amazing. So is food medicine? <sighs> food gives life in the sense that we need food to live. Everybody needs food to live and God made us that way. Just like he, he made us to need sleep and oxygen and water. Um, and I think you can eat in such a way that you are sinning against your body. Yeah. I do think that's the case. So I'm not an agnostic about food. Like I'm not trying to say you eat nothing but donuts for the rest of your life and that's cool. You're good. Right. Um, no, you're being a poor steward. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you will, you will feel badly. You will, you will, um, you will not enjoy living in your body if that's what you're doing and, with your body. In, in contrast to that, if you are constantly in a calorie deficit, you're right. also being a poor steward of your body. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're constantly living on the threshold of starvation. Right. Yeah. And I think the, the issue with, the, with these things and the, what makes it so hard is that, you know, these things are a continuum. And so if you start saying it is a sin to eat at McDonald's every day for the rest of your life, then... Okay, I'm not willing to say that. Well, is it a sin to eat at McDonald's once a week for the rest of your life? Is it? And then, and you know, like there are Christians who are going to say it's a sin to eat white sugar ever for the rest of your life, you know? Um, I think about uh, our time. So, my, me and my wife were missionaries in the jungles of Peru. Oh. And, uh, you know, the only thing you can really eat much of in the jungle is a little bit of protein and a lot of simple carbohydrates. Right. Plantains, uh -huh. yucca, white rice. Just how people have lived in most every culture for most of history. Yeah. And everywhere. I can just imagine having a conversation with uh -huh. someone today going, well, you're killing your body. Uh -huh. Well, what other option do they have? Uh -huh. You know, the most of the vegetables, you can't really grow vegetables out there. It's really difficult. When you get them in from the lancha, they're halfway rotten by the time they get to you, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, have you noticed 
have you ever interacted with a Christian who, whenever they talk about physical, psychological, and maybe even spiritual ailments, they somehow always connect it back to their diet? Oh, yeah. 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 What's up with that? It's just easy. It's nice to have an answer. It's nice. It's nice to have a simple answer for everything. And it would be great if that was the answer to everything. But it, I just don't think it is. Um, you know, I have kids. So I, I have I have young children who I'm trying to teach to eat too. And I know I know that there's a temptation as a, as moms who are feeding people all the time. Like we are we are the ones who are having to make these decisions. What is the best thing for me to feed to my kids? You know, how do I weigh budget and all these, all the information? And, and I know that it's hard. It is. Um, and it would be, it would be easier if someone would just give you a set of rules that you could just stick with in some ways. Um, but I think, you know, when it comes to me trying to guide my kids, I want them to be I don't want them to be a slave to anything, um, but I want them to be people who recognize that food is not just fuel for your body. It's also a social and a cultural and relational um, ritual. And it is a way of loving people and serving people and connecting to people. And if you can't go to someone's house and eat what's put before you, that's rude no matter where you are. Like that's rude in every in every time, in every place, I think. Um, so if what you're, if you've been so trained to think of food as either poison or medicine that you can't go and sit down and eat what's put before you, then you're definitely sinning when it comes to food. But that was, that was in the epistles. Like that's, that's, that kind of stuff is, that's, that what, that's what you know about food from the Bible. You may not know for sure that, we were meant to eat on grains only because that's what was given to us in Genesis or what do you know, what are yeah. some of these books that come out like the maker's diet, yeah. the, um, there's a lot of things that we could guess about what we're supposed to eat from the Bible, but I know there are things we know about food from the Bible and they have to do with relationships. And those are, those are paramount, you know? I think that's the part of the book that hit me over and over again, like a dart, just right, right here, you know, just conviction, because I've been that, maybe not for the food snob reasons, maybe more for the asceticism reasons. Mm -hmm. But I've been the guy who has been at someone's house and been like, oh, this is what we're having for dinner. Let me go run and grab a salad. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. And go, oh, what's the big deal? You know, like. Yeah. And everyone well, does it. So yeah. it's just, you. it gets where people don't even raise an eyebrow, but it's just like, like, you know, our, our moms told us to eat, to eat what was set before us as, a, you know, as a this is just a polite thing to do. It's a kind thing to do. And of course, if you're the one serving a meal to somebody, try I'd to be accommodating. Try to be accommodating. Yeah. Like it's, you know, there's every side of this is love. And, and we're, that's repeated to us over and over again. Um, it's about yeah. yeah, loving people well. What does asceticism have to do with the teaching of demons? Do not taste, do not handle, do not touch. That's demonic logic. The logic. First Timothy three. Right. Yeah. Um, the logic of demons is don't touch the things that God has made because they are inherently dangerous. Um, and the logic of Christ is all these things are safe for us. Not just safe. But That's good right. to be That's enjoyed. Right. That's right. These things were given to us um, to be taken with thanksgiving. And we don't need to be afraid of things God made. I don't want to move on from this point too quickly because it's really profound. Satan is trying to get us to not enjoy God through his creation. Yeah. And whenever we end up in this pattern, not saying that there's never a season of your life where you don't need to be on a diet or watch what you eat or whatever. But when we have, end up in this pattern where we are just unable to enjoy God through his creation, mm -hmm. that is a direct demonic attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before we move on from asceticism, what would you say to someone who is a serial dieter, like someone who is just trapped in the loop? Maybe they've been that way for two years. Maybe they've been that way for 20 years. What, what would you say to them? 
Yeah. Um, I would say that I just don't, I don't know of a path out of dieting that leads through dieting. I just don't, I don't know. Personally, I've not found that path. Um, I, I think I know people who diet pretty comfortably, like where it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't take over their brain. It doesn't take over their minds. Like they're just, it's just something they do. Um, I know a handful of people like that who it does, it's not a cycle. Like they just, they just kind of find a comfortable way of living and it, and it happens to be with parameters. Um, I don't mind that. I, I don't, I, I did not find that possible. For me, me neither. Yeah. So what I found instead was a ricochet back and forth between gluttony and asceticism and just new versions of rules to kind of help me get control over the flesh, which was, for the record, out of control. So the path out was not, unfortunately, for me at least, was not found through a diet that was just the best diet. Um, it was through learning to sit down and enjoy a meal. And also the process of learning to cook for people, having kids to, to feed and a husband to feed was a big, huge help for me because, because dieting and being in, in, in eating disorder stuff, that is a private way to beat yourself up alone in a kitchen or alone somewhere. That's, that's, what, that, that's how that worked for me. It was, it was a lonely battle. Um, but as soon as you bring other people into it to serve through the food, it changed a lot. Um, but the other thing was starting to recognize just why our, our culture doesn't seem to understand seasons and, and cycles. And I mentioned that earlier. Um, so there's a, there's a really great passage in Paralandra by C.S. Lewis. Lewis yeah. Um, I always think that of, of that, of that, um, series, Paralander is the one that women like the most. Um, mm. and, and I feel like men tend to like the, uh, that hideous strength the most, at least that's, that's what the polls have yeah. shown so far. But anyway, makes sense. Paralander, um, so where the garden of this is the Eden garden is of Eden. reimagined that's right. on that's another planet. Right. It's Eve, yes. Eve all over again, yeah. the green lady, and she's being tempted, you know, and you get to watch the temptation and under maybe understand it a little better. But um, but there's a you know, ransom is in this book as well, and he's on this planet watching the temptation happening, but he's experiencing this planet and he he gets, he, at some point, he finds this really wonderful fruit. He tastes the fruit for the first time. It's this amazing fruit. And he has a temptation to go back and try to repeat that first bite of the fruit. And, and, um, and he can't. He, re, he realizes it would, it would be like trying to sit down and listen to a symphony again. When you just listen to a symphony, trying to rewind it to the beginning, you couldn't because you couldn't experience the fr you can't you can't ever have the first bite twice no of anything no um but the we first wish kiss, we could the first high that's right yeah that's right you can never have but but even like this particular time that you sat down to eat blueberry pancakes or whatever you can't have the first bite again um you can't have the first pancake again and i think part of the wisdom of of life is is understanding that when God sends waves towards you. This is another analogy from Paralandra. You can't, you can't repeat the waves as they come. He's sending these waves to you, and you can swim out into them, but you can't ask him to repeat the same wave over, and you can't turn back into the wave that he's already sent because it's gone. So when you finish a good meal or any meal, when you finish a meal, Part of being a grown-up is recognizing that the meal is over and it's time to go do something else. And it's time to go have a conversation or do your work or take a nap or whatever that next wave is that God is sending to you, the meal's over. And you can never repeat it um, because if you try to, you, you become miserable. <laughs> so that was huge for me because I never... 
I never paid enough attention to the meal to know that it was over because I was trying to, you know, pound donuts while watching a show or whatever, order another ice cream cone while driving through a window. Like Americans don't know how to do this because we don't know how to sit down and eat our food. Um, we think that food is something that we we do while we're in the middle of something else. Like we can't make life stop for meals. It's so funny you say that. Yeah. I feel like I cannot enjoy my dessert unless I'm exactly where I need to be on my couch watching the video mm -hmm. that I want to be watching. Uh -huh. You know, like. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be the right place at the right time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow. Uh, C.S. Lewis, man, the more you dig, the more there is to find. Oh, yeah. Uh, better than I would say maybe perhaps it Tolkien. Oh, okay. Just checking. More could be said about asceticism, but that's why people should read the book. Let's move on to gluttony. Is gluttony too much desire or not enough? It's too much. Is, is it, it too much enjoyment of your food or not enough enjoyment of your food? Yeah. Too much desire? I don't know. I mean, I think there is, if you're going to use the word desire, then there's inordinate desire. You know, if you're thinking about food above all things all day long, then you're probably um, imbalanced. And that actually reminds me, I don't know if this was even in this book, but Lewis, once again, he had something else to say about, about sexuality and food. Um, and because he was saying, he was, he was talking about the sexual issue in, at his, in his day that people were obsessed with whatever, with sex. And he was saying that this is a sign of starvation. Like if you were in a culture and you went into a dark tent and people unveiled a meal and said, and there was like a strip tease for a meal. That would be a sign I of totally a starving people. Yeah. Yes, do you remember this? Yes, I don't even yes. remember where this was. I don't either. But um, but if for him, he was like, this is an obvious sign of imbalance and and of starvation, you know, in your culture if somebody is willing to sit and watch a meal. And and he was saying the Which, point the way, he was if, making was about sexuality. Yeah. He was saying if you have people who are like, oh, let's, you know, let's talk about this. So there's this, this is a sign that there's not a healthy marriage bed basically in your country. And I was, when I read that, my thought was, this is a, he's, he's, he's writing this as a joke. Oh, what if people watched a strip tease about a meal? But people do that in we our culture. We have a term for it now. We, we call it food porn. That's right. That's right. That's right. We have, you know, TV shows and um, commercial, you know, slow, like slow zoom commercials about burgers or whatever. Like we have, we have food porn in our culture. And I do think it is a sign of starvation. It's a kind of starvation where we're obsessed with food, but we still don't really know how to enjoy it. We have an abundance of something, right? but it's not what it ought to be. Maybe it's not. Yeah. Maybe because it's not, a lot of it isn't, isn't great food. Um, yeah. but the other thing is we don't, we don't have any kind of cycles of like fasting and feasting because we're kind of in feasting mode at all times. And this is going to probably sound different from the sort of anti-dieting that I'm talking about here, but I have a real strong place in my mind for fasting and feasting cycles that, you know, maybe today isn't a day where you have to eat all these lovely flavors. Maybe today you just have time for beans and rice, you know, and you don't, if you're not thinking about food all the time, you have other things in life that you also get to think about. Um, it's just, it's not feasting time all the time. Okay. Then you might be relieving some of my guilt and frustration here. I kind of go through, uh, cycles, maybe not like one day out of the week, but maybe like one month out of four where I just, I rein in all my food stuff. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, man, I've been eating like a Viking by mm -hmm. God's grace. I live in America. Mm -hmm. I have access to good food all the time right. and I enjoy it. You know, I don't have to work like a Viking, but I can eat like exactly, a Viking. Exactly. But then for like a month, I'll do like keto or something like mm -hmm. that. And I'll just, just, just yeah. to kind of tighten everything up, learn to enjoy food again, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, uh, revive those insulin receptors. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Now, I'm sure part of that is unhealthy, but what you're, what you're saying is that there is a way that you can do that that is useful. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. If, it, if, you're, if you're loving people in that, like you're still, if your wife is not tearing her hair out, trying to deal with, keep up with whatever is happening, and you're, you're able to go and enjoy fellowship with people and not be obnoxious, you know, not talk about keto the whole time, um, and you're not all tore up in knots about it, then I don't think there's a problem with 
having cycles where you're like, okay, I ate a lot last week. You know, this week I'm going to, I'm going to tighten up, back, back up a little yeah. bit, like back up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I I'm definitely in a season in life when probably for the first time ever, busyness is such just with children and with all these fun projects in our, in our town and in our church, I probably have less time to think about food than I ever have. Um, and there's, there are times when it's like, wow, I really forgot, you know, I forgot breakfast again or whatever. And I don't love that, but I'm at, like, I'm at peace with that. I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about that. You know, I hope I get to the place where I can ever forget a meal. That would be nice. Well, I do think, yeah, I'm just, whatever you, we can talk about, I feel like I'm talking with a girlfriend, my, <laughs> you know, when your metabolism slows down yeah. and you're, you know, you've had a few babies and yeah, you, you know, you yeah, know how know it you're is. Yeah. You're just not as hungry anymore. Uh, yeah, obviously. I don't, obviously, know. I don't know that, you know, someone like you or my, my husband, like, I think men probably just stay hungrier, Yeah. but I mean, it's maybe that's an obvious thing to say, but anyway, um, yeah, like cycles you you can't feast every day right. you can't feast every week um but don't fast every week either right you know find the balance yeah find the balance okay what do you what do you mean when you write about having a bad food day oh yeah that's just that was just the the language that we would use to describe the eating disorder stuff like if i if i ever ate way 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 too much you know, binged basically. Mm -hmm. That's a bad food day. Yeah. I think I have a lot of those. Mm -hmm. uh, are we all gluttons now? I think about going back to my time in Peru. We almost never, I say almost, we did. I guess it feels, I, I want to say it that way in relation to my experience in the United States. I want to say we almost never gathered around food, but I know that that's not true. We did mm -hmm. because that's a human thing. Mm -hmm. But in the States, it's like we can't do anything without having a lot of food. It's mm -hmm. like, hey, we're going to have this get together. Okay, well, who's going to bring the food? Mm -hmm. well, why does it have to be food? Because <laughs> so, uh, why would people show up? Why would, why would, it, why would anyone want fellowship? to come? Yeah. I don't want to <laughs> no see way. people. Yeah. So of course, you're in the are, are South, too. Gluttons? I mean, I'm Tennessee. You're, That's you are know, true. here we are in Alabama. I know that, I know that the South maybe has more of a... That's southern Mormon hospitality. Idea. Yeah, it's just yeah. the southern. I mean, we we potluck at our church every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Wow. And it's awesome. <laughs> I love it so much because we get to know each other like crazy in our church. Of course, we have a small church and we stay small. How many members? Oh, I wish you wouldn't ask me Sorry. things that I don't know. Um, 100, 200? 150 maybe. Okay. I don't know. The thing is, our church will stay small enough to always have a potluck because I feel like when you have something like that in place, you just tend to kind of, you max out. You can't really potluck more than about 150 people. Um, I think this is, I can't back this up at all, but I, I think that churches should stay small enough that they can do potlucks. I Every like church it. everywhere. While Amen, I'm just, While sister. I'm just talking crazy. Yeah, I just think, right. I just think it's so, it's so great. Like, I just don't know of any any other thing that would keep us in each other's lives like that potluck does, besides Wednesday night prayer meetings and Sunday morning services and Sunday morning, <laughs> and of course <laughs> preaching the word. There you go. But no, I get it. We uh, we do we have five members meetings a year, and mm -hmm. every it goes church, and then we go into a potluck, and then we come out of the potluck and go into our members meeting and then the Lord's Supper. Uh -huh. And I love it. I love mm -hmm. it so much. And since our church caught on fire, we've been. Uh, have this lovely chapel that we're in, but How we did have that fire start. Was it a potluck? <laughs> it was a heater in the wall. I wish I could blame it on a crock pot or something, but uh, we haven't been able to do it. It makes me sad, mm -hmm. you know, cause I just love yeah. it. It's so, it's so fun. Yeah. We used to do Wednesday night dinners too, mm -hmm. but I think it was just too hard for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're you're kind of connecting the everybody gets together and eats. So we can't see how to get together without eating. Yeah. You know, it's maybe part of the issue. I I still just feel like drive through drive through culture is more of an issue for Americans Amen. than that we eat together too much. Yeah. But you want to riff on that at all? Yeah, I just because it's like we just we truly think food is is like calories to be pounded while you're on your way to doing something else. And 
Because life. we're so busy. Because we're just so busy and we just don't have time to deal with people around a table, families families sitting around. I mean, there are, there are documented um, anorexia cases. Like there, there are, there are programs where all that they die, all that they recommend for an, an anorexic girl is that they sit around and eat as a family. Her, her, te- a teenage anorexic, sit down and eat as a family for a month together, and like that is that is the treatment, mm-hmm. and it's actually helpful um, because <sighs> food is not just about calories. Like it's not just about numbers. It's about people. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Okay. Let's go on to snobbery. Okay. Let's talk about different kinds of food snobs. I, I, I created like three categories. You fill these out, add to, subtract, do whatever you think. You've thought about this more than I have. I think we have consumer driven snobbery. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think I got that phrase from you. So that's cheating. That's one thing that came from your book. I don't remember book. that. <laughs> I got it directly I from your remember. book. Uh, so maybe we won't talk about that one. Health driven snobbery mm-hmm. and then culinary driven snobbery. Okay. So start wherever you want. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I like those categories. Um, yeah. So the consumer thing, I, I do remember talking about just how there's just this like trickle down. Um, like, again, I'm talking to a man, but have you seen The Devil Wears Prada? Uh, yeah. And it's one of my favorite uh, movie illustrations ever. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's hilarious. Um, I don't think Justin has seen that movie, so I can't talk about this with him, but he, Big um, yeah, right. Um, the, just the thing that I remember about that movie that a lot of people remember is, okay. is, is about this blue sweater and the girl who's like, I'm not into fashion. I'm wearing a blue sweater that mm-hmm. whatever. And Meryl Streep gives this big takedown where she says, you think that you don't care about fashion, right. but that sweater was chosen for you by the people in this mm-hmm. room because two seasons ago, Oscar, whatever. And it was she on goes the wrong way. Yeah. That's right. So, so I use that in my spiel on wokeness. Okay. So it's funny wow. that the exact same thing, okay. the exact same scene is one of my favorite scenes That's to use. Hilarious. That's so funny. Okay. So okay. it's the kind of thing that kind of sticks in your mind yeah. because you realize, oh yeah, we are, we are driven by what the taste makers tell us to like. And we think we have taste and we, pro- you know, whatever, maybe we have taste, but our tastes have been formed for us by these people in these industries. And it is the same way in food. If you walk into a Whole Foods and you think I am such a discerning eater that I come into Whole Foods and I'm going to get the herbal, you know, sparkling water. Whatever, whatever. Yeah. yeah like it, whatever the year is. And there you can go on, the, you can go online yeah. and you can see Whole Foods telling it's, it's, investors, here's the fad for this year. Here are the five biggest things, you know, and you realize- Kale is out. That's right. Kale's gone. Almond milk is in. That's right. Yeah. I hear they're actually going to start going to bovine milk. Have you heard of this? Bovine milk. Yes. (laughs) It's it's the next big thing. Sounds great. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, So um, we're not not as cool. Yeah. It's okay. We're not as cool as we think we are because we can walk into a Whole Foods or- wherever it is and, and order that thing. Um, so, so that's consumer, consumer snobbery. Dri- yeah. yeah. Let's talk about health snobbery. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously this is heavily connected to the asceticism thing. If you're trying to save your life by eating the right things, um, if you become really convinced, this is how, this is how this works. Like this is how you extend your life. This is how you get your body fat down and your muscle mass up or whatever it is you're trying to do. You're going to defend that to the death, literally, because that's what you're trying to stave off by eating that way. Um, so you, you, you will be willing to be very rude about it. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're off balance, you're going to be rude about it. And, I do know people who, like in high pressure situations, like meeting a mother in law for the first time type situations, have brought their own food to that family meal because they're on this diet. And I'm just like And in their mind, they think, Oh, well, I'm being I'm being super gracious. I'm being good. Here. Yeah, yeah, I'm right. not putting That's them right. Out. I'm not making I'm not making them do my thing. Right. But 
like you should be able, unless you have a you know a dire food allergy. If you legitimately allergy. have celiac disease, that's right. Okay, that's right. makes it, let's let somebody know. I about don't want to go but, to the hospital with you tonight. That's fine, yeah. but you should be able to go in, into someone's home, especially if it's a mother-in-law that you're meeting for the first time. You should be able to sit down and eat her food, yeah. um, even if you don't eat a lot. That's you right. know, take a you bite. Don't. Thank you so much. That's for, right. You don't have to eat everything you're you're yeah. given. Yeah. So. Okay. So we have the the. Yeah, sorry, a quick word before we move on on that on that health driven snobbery. I know that life is complicated, but if if you really are concerned about health, which there's nothing wrong with that. If you if your concern is I want to be a good steward of my body, I want to mm -hmm. live long enough to be a, a great grandma so I can help out and all that stuff, great. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, one, there's only so much you can do. Two, it's really not that complicated. If you basically just try to av avoid eating a ton of processed foods, mm -hmm. in, in CrossFit, they used to say, uh, just eat around the outside of the grocery store. Yeah, I remember that. Right? Yeah. Just stay away from the middle aisles, you mm -hmm. know, fresh fruit, meat, nuts, vegetables, yeah. all that stuff. If yeah. you just try to eat a diet that's not that processed, that's not totally wacky, you're going to be a be basically healthy person. You don't have to work out like a monster twice a day, seven days a week. If you get moderate exercise three or four days a week, even if it's just walking, mm -hmm. it's 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 going to be fine. Like, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. So you can be concerned with health and how that relates to your food without becoming a complete whack job. Yeah. Preaching to myself here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then culinary driven snobbery. Yeah. 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 I mean, I probably, I probably am this kind of snob sometimes even right now because I'm, I'm into the cooking thing now and um, I'm not actually that good of a cook. Um, like I have a lot of, I have a lot of friends who just understand flavor yeah. in a way that I wish that I could, but I just can't. Um, but I do think if I'm going to fall into anything at this, at the moment, at this season in my life, you know, I'm, I like, I like reading cookbooks. I like whatever. I like trying, I like trying at least, even though it doesn't come naturally to me. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, if you, if you're, I live in Hartsville, Tennessee, it's the smallest county in Tennessee. We have two Mexican restaurants and a meet and three place that's been open forever and um and one other place that may you might you can get a burger there so like restaurants are not happening where we are um but we're an hour away from nashville where you know culinary snobbery is alive and well certainly but they have great restaurants um there would be a way that i could talk about food also i'm in a church where the people in the pew are um middle-aged people who are have lived in Hartsville their entire lives who have enjoyed meat and three cooking and love it forever um and then a huge number of young families who have come in from California and New York and other places like that um and then there's me who's lived in Hartsville for about 15 years you know doesn't go out to eat very much likes food so like I, there are ways that I could talk about food that would be extremely alienating to either any of those groups. And there are ways that they could talk about food with each other when they're having each other to, to, to each other's houses, which they do all the time, I should just say, because we don't have restaurants, but also because we have a great hospitality culture in our church. Um, but when they're having each other over, there are ways they could do that very rudely or very unhelpfully. And then there are ways that they could do it super graciously and just make awesome food for the meat and three guy. And he's going to be like, wow, what is this? You know, yeah. a moose bouche. I've yeah. never heard of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So honestly, it's delightful. It's delightful to watch these incredible cooks have the, the, like the guy who's, who's been eating McDonald's his whole life and loving it, you know, to have him over and give him a slow cooked braised pork loin or whatever, like, it's delightful to watch. Do you go food hunting like on vacations and stuff when you travel? <sighs> yeah. I mean, I'll, I want to go to a place that I've never been usually. Yeah. I say that we went, we went and ate mellow mushroom last night when we had other choices. So. You guys were in town. We were. Wow. Yeah. If somebody would have let me know, well, I could have put you guys on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Wow. That's really sad for you. We enjoyed it very much, sir. <laughs>
Oh, there you go. We so enjoyed it's not, it. See, look at this. We were me happy. being pretentious again, right? I'm a, <laughs> see? I'm a food snob. I'm like, you have mellow mushroom. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you poor sad thing. We had a great time. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very cultured. I mean, uh-huh. buffalo wild wings. Right. Uh, you know, all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be this is probably going to be one of the more controversial things we talk about here. I'm oh, not in- intending to go for clickbaits, but uh, clickbait or anything. Well, I like heard that. that you just had the Canon guys on last week. Justin just told me that yeah. a couple of days ago. I was like, oh, what's yeah. going on? That, mm-hmm. <laughs> we're living in interesting times. Yeah. Talk to us about people who dabble in food allergies. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So we talked about the, the um, gluten kind of thing. I don't know. I don't even hear about gluten intolerance very much right now. So I maybe do, it's so still happening. Maybe okay. it's regional. Yeah, it might be regional. I think it came and went. Um, so dabbling in allergies, I think it's just there. there's a temptation when you don't feel great all the time. Maybe because you, you know, we're we're all gluttonous and we don't feel great all the time. But I think there's a ten, a temptation to be like, I need to find the answer and the reason, the panacea that's going to fix everything. And it would be really great if I found out that that was an allergy to something like gluten. If I could just eliminate that thing, then everything would be better. Um, but, and I think in some cases it might help. Like maybe, sure, yeah. maybe. Maybe yeah. you should just eliminate gluten and you'll feel better. Like some people, um, like Russell, our assistant pastor, pastor Russell Berger, yeah. if he eats a peanut, he'll die. Right. You know, that's real. Yeah, it's okay. a continuum. And yeah. maybe, yeah, and, I, and I, I'm and i not, I'm not a doctor, so is he up there right he now? There. <laughs> okay. Um, like the dabbling is just, I think when a, when a person who maybe doesn't have hard data is is kind of trying to, trying to live in an allergy that they don't necessarily know that they have. Um, but I don't really, it doesn't bother me if, if somebody's like, I'm going to, I'm avoiding this thing because I think I feel better when I avoid this thing. Yeah. Whatever. It yeah, was a you're, bigger you're deal. You're free to like, you know, experiment on your own body if you want. Say, I want to try not eating dairy. See if that helps. Right. Great. Yeah. Cause you know what? A lot of people actually are lactose intolerant. Yes. That's real. Yeah. My husband is in denial about being lactose intolerant. I'm, I'm fully convinced. But you that suffer he is. the consequences <laughs> yeah, right. whenever he eats dairy. That's I right. bet. Yeah. But it is a real problem. There are a lot of people who they're, whenever their body doesn't feel good, the first thing that they do is they say, there must be something that I'm eating that's causing this. Mm-hmm. When the fact is, it could be 50,000 different things that are, you yeah. may not be sleeping well. You have three small children at home. You mm-hmm. could be going through depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are getting older. And guess mm-hmm. what? Your body is slowly dying. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you could have cancer. I mean, I'm not trying to be right. morose, but I mean. Th- that's could- probably worse than you think. You're dying. <laughs> yes, that's right. But the yeah. thing is, actually, I mean, I, that was a joke, but but we are dying. And that is, that is something I think. I think that we miss in, in this conversation. And I do think it's, it's part of, part of what I was saying about the world looking for answers to death. Um, Christians need to be aware of death in a way that the world isn't. And we need to be, we need to have a comfortable awareness of our mortality um, because that is a big part of this is, is we need to recognize we're dying. And so no, we're, we're probably not going to feel as well this year as we did last year. That's right. If yeah. we're over the age of 18. That's that's right. Metabolism is going to slow down. Skin is going to loosen. Gravity is going to take its effect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Energy levels are going to drop. One more thing on this food allergy stuff. I think one of the things that needs to be mentioned is that a lot of this stuff is pseudoscience. Right. Throw it in the same category as the vast majority of chiropractics. It's Mm -hmm. just a lot of this stuff is not proven data driven science. It's anecdotal. And there's a massive uh, financial incentive for people to market this to, yeah. to Western to Westerners in particular who have the, right. <laughs> the ability to waste money on things like this. Yeah. Uh, for example, like doing juice fasts and, mm-hmm. and cleanses. Uh, you're not going to drink just lemon juice for five days and cleanse any heavy metal toxins from your body. Mm-hmm. That's, everything about that statement is just antithetical to good science about Mm -hmm. how the human body works. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I don't know how I want to put a bow on this, but I just want to say to people like, 
if, if, uh, for example, with essential oils, I don't want to offend you if you love essential oils. Okay. I wish Justin was here though. Okay. He has some things to say about that. Well, I'll speak, I'll be his spirit animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was, when we were in, in, in the jungle, we were going through some depression mm-hmm. and, yeah. uh, somebody said, Hey, here's some essential oils. This will help. You know, mm-hmm. there's a, a, a billboard that used to be up in our city that said anxiety, depression, chronic pain, CBD can fix it. Right. So yeah. If if CBD or lavender oil or mm-hmm. ylang lang tea tree oil, if mm-hmm. that stuff could actually do anything as significant as what it's being marketed to do, mm-hmm. the pharmaceutical companies would have snatched that up, regulated it, and made billions of dollars a long time ago. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that none of this stuff is useful. So, for example, you know that peppermint oil can help with migraines. Mm-hmm. But the reason why peppermint oil does that is because it overwhelms your olfactory system Really? Yeah, that's right. So just it it stimulates that and it it kind of, your nerves can only fire so much at once and Mm -hmm. your brain kind of switches to focus on the the strong smell of peppermint under your nose as opposed to the pain in your head. And this is nothing new. Dr. Paul Brand, who used to work with, he's a Christian, um, used to work with uh, leprosy patients, used to talk to them about how to stimulate nerves and combat pain and all this stuff. Anyways. Interesting. That actually has real scientific basis. Mm -hmm. What I find doubly problematic is when Christians get involved with selling this stuff and promoting this stuff as if it actually has spiritual and medical benefits Yeah. when it has not been proven in any way that it does. You're in a really ethically dangerous place as a Christian when you're doing that. So, you know, feel free to take some oils if you think it might help with something. Yeah, but it's these big old, big old statements about it and, and, and tying the spiritual stuff in, in with it is dicey. It's real dicey. Really dicey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to say something else? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, good. Well, (laughs) that's enough for now. All right. Let's talk about, let's talk about apathy. Mm -hmm. Are we sinning when we fail to enjoy food? God made food for us to enjoy richly to enjoy all things. If we never notice our food, I think we're sinning. I think we're I think if we walk by a sunset and don't notice it, we're <laughs> sinning. I think there's a lot of things in life that if you can't see them, smell them, appreciate them and thank God for them, then you're um you're spiritually blind too. You know. So what do you say to the person? I'm a, I live to eat kind of person. Mm-hmm. Like I'm always excited about the next good meal. Yeah. What do you say to the, I just eat to live person? The person who says, I don't even really taste food. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know if it's like my sense of smell or what, but like, and I'm, I'm really busy and I just know that I have to eat in order to live. Like, mm-hmm. what would you say to them to encourage them to like learn yeah. to enjoy their food? Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I recognize that different people are more alive to different senses and and joys and Mm. pleasures. And just as I know, um, there are people who don't enjoy film. I enjoy film. There are people who don't enjoy I can tell because you call it film. Whatever. I'm trying to be (laughs) obnoxious. Um, Who don't enjoy reading. And it is very hard for me to connect to that person, but I try very hard. Um, I, I recognize that maybe your tongue and your brain and your nose and all the things that go into food for you are just not not the most exciting thing to you, and that's okay, you know. If I saw that you were dull, sen- if you had dull senses to all of God's creation and other things as well, I would say I think there's a big spiritual problem here. If I saw you delighting in God's creation in other ways and food was just like not high on the list for you, I would say, fine, yeah. like fine. Would you say, but let me cook a meal for you? It'll <laughs> no. totally no, change No, but I would say, but everything. let this person cook a meal <laughs> yeah. for you. I would, I would point them to the person that I think ought to. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, you have, at, so, so let's, there's more that could be said about each of those four, but again, buy the book, read it. Listen, when I got halfway through this book, I immediately bought a bunch of copies to give away for our church and I immediately added it to our women's discipleship cohort. Oh, that's So, sweet. I mean, if you're like, all right, they've stimulated my appetite. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I want to know more. I want my my brain stomach to get fuller. All right, now I'm stretching it. <laughs> then buy the book. Seriously, you won't regret it. Uh, but at several points throughout the interview, you have kind of, you've kept trying to get back to like food and hospitality, food and community, food and fellowship. That yeah. seems like it's kind of the heartbeat of this whole conversation. Yeah, maybe that's because when I was writing this book, I was probably more frustrated about like, um, it's possible that the impetus for writing the book was more frustration about food snobbery stuff, dabbling in allergies type stuff. That was a more, that felt like a more live issue maybe four years ago. Um, now having lived another four years of life and having old, you know, children and more, more years of just being a pastor's wife in a, in a church, I'm, I think it, the stuff that sticks with me more instead of the, the immediate problems of food snobbery is just food being used as a gift to bless people. And that's what it does. It does seem like that's kind of the, the gold that remains after the dross of whatever's happening in that moment culturally. Yeah. Um, that, that's what seems to, to remain for me. So yeah. I think this is something that we can learn from Middle Eastern cultures. They mm -hmm. very much use food as a as a blessing to people. Mm -hmm. Come in, partake of this food with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Uh, which is funny because, you know, the Bible is not a Western book. You know, the Bible is an ancient Near Eastern yeah. book, so it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the difference? Let's talk about what gets in the way of using food to be hospitable. Let's start with this. Tell me, what is the difference between, uh, by the way, are your arms burning? Are you doing okay holding up No, I mic? work out. I so. can tell. Yeah. <laughs> you must eat a lot of protein. I'm yeah, it's because I <laughs> ate so much protein. I've, I've been changing hands yeah, you're doing great. as we go. So, well, What is the difference? Oh, also, yeah. let me just say this. Please. I have a baby right now that weighs 25 pounds at 11 months. So That's a big baby. This is a small microphone. Yeah. Yeah. You're, this is nothing for you. <laughs> What is the difference between hospitality and entertaining? Okay. Um, well, there was an awesome, awesome piece some years ago by Jen Wilkin that that answered that exact question. I think I quoted it in the book um, because she was the first one that I remember saying, hospitality versus entertaining. Here's the difference. Um, and definitely rings true still these, you know, few years later. Entertaining is not sustainable. You cannot entertain all the time. It's exhausting, especially not when you have four children under the age of 10, which I do. Um, so here's what you have to do in order to get to get where instead of entertaining people, you're being hospitable to people. You have to narrow the gap between what you cook normally and do normally with just your family and what you do with other people. Because with entertaining, there's a huge gap. You have to bring the bar either way up in order to get to that, that level or... Um, well, there's just, there's a big gap and it bothers me. Like it bothers me when I realize, oh, I haven't made fresh bread for my own family in weeks and weeks, but I'm willing to do the crusty sourdough for someone else. That bothers me because my children are also people that I'm trying to be hospitable to in life. Like, so you have to either bring the ordinary family meal up or bring the, the, the company meal down and hopefully maybe a little of both so that they're kind of meeting in the middle where basically when you have somebody over, you just have somebody over and maybe the yeah. pot's a little bit bigger, you know, but it's like, it's the same pizza that you're making for your family on Friday. You yeah. just make more. Uh, 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 as a pastor of a small church, we have people over a lot. Yeah. And as a kindness to my wife, who is not particularly adept at cooking, and uh -huh. I wouldn't offend her by saying that uh -huh. she would laugh and heartily amen. Right, right. We have sandwiches yeah. when people come over. Yeah. Uh, but here's how I kick it up just one notch. I get the good meat from Publix. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And I get the hearty white bread. The, the, yeah, the, the thick stuff. The thick stuff. That's yeah. right. And so uh, that's our way of like, okay, we're going <laughs> to be fancy. This is a company meal now. <laughs> that's right. And yeah. see, I would love to be over at, at a person's house for that meal. Like I love the you know, the fancy Publix, Publix sandwich. Oh, it's real fancy. It's for real. But we'll do so, like paper plates, yeah. you know, so that yeah. she doesn't have to do, because mm -hmm. it's one thing if you're having people over to your house like once a month, mm -hmm. great, throw the doors wide open, make a big meal, bust mm -hmm. out the china, I guess if people still do that. Um, yeah. But uh, when you're, I think especially when your spiritual gift is hospitality of, among others, mm -hmm. like 
if you're having people in your home twice a week, that's a lot, you know, so lower the bar mm -hmm. and focus on good conversation over, you know, take whatever two other hours you were going to spend making that fantastic over the top good meal mm -hmm. and just make a decent meal, you mm -hmm. know, a good meal that people can enjoy. Right. And then rest up and just be ready to have fun and hang. Yeah. 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 So, um, another book that I love, 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 love that really people should go and buy first before they go to try to buy this book. Okay. Um, Robert Capon's The Supper of the Lamb. It's, it's, it was huge in, in writing this book, actually. Okay. Um, I think you quote him pretty extensively. Yeah, in your I'm last sure chapter. that I do. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure that I do. So he, he has this, these categories in his book about festal and ferial eating. That so was the, my next question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, the festal is like when everybody gets their own their own plated meal and there's they've got their own cut of meat and these beautiful sides or whatever like festal is is the the special occasion meal it's the feast and then ferial is all the other meals in between where you're using you know a bunch of carbs basically to fill people up like you're feeding rice or whatever but he has so he has this recipe in the book which I've never actually made before but it's it's using one Maybe it's like one cut of lamb to feed eight people four different times. So it's basically where you're making stew. Like at that level, you're just you're making soup out of the bones or whatever. So you make it go further. And the but the idea is that it's cheaper. You know, ferial eating is cheaper because you're using a little meat to go a long way with other more normal whatever more normal ingredients. But yeah. but that's also part of this this cycle this cycles right. yeah. of eating thing. Right. That like sometimes it's time for beans and rice, and sometimes and also. My family is from Louisiana. My my parents, both of my parents are from Louisiana. So when we had people growing up, we we had we had red beans and rice, we had gumbo, we had jambalaya, we had etouffee. Like these are big pots, huge pots where rice is a big ingredient and you have a little meat in there, but it's like it's a stew. And, and then when the rice is left over, you make boudin balls. Oh yeah. yeah. We never made it. We always oh. bought it. Oh, okay. Um so like, you know, Cajun cooking is a great example. I mean, every culture has this though. Every culture has the huge meal that you make with, with starches and a little bit of meat and it goes a long way, you know. Go, that cycle thing even makes me think about how, like you, you cannot enjoy a filet mignon three times a day. No. You just can't do it. Yeah. If you eat enough hamburger helper, Mm -hmm. that filet mignon is going to hit different. Mm -hmm. And all of life is like that. Mm -hmm. You talk to young people who get married and what they expect the marriage bed to be like, you know, mm -hmm. every night fireworks. It's like, ah, yeah. I don't think it works like that. You yeah. know, the ratio is not right. And if it right. was, then what you're talking about isn't actually fireworks because mm -hmm. it is the exception, you know. Right. The truly amazing thing yeah. can't be the constant thing. Yeah. Like nobody wants to go to a fireworks show every night of the week. Yeah. It would be very boring. But yeah, we always talk about it again. This is food, food and and sexuality again. But <laughs> they go together. Uh, they, yeah. <laughs> but um, somebody told us when we were getting married that sex is kind of like pizza. Like sometimes it's really good pizza, and sometimes it's just pizza. But it's always it's always good. Yeah. Like, even you know. You never turn down pizza. Yeah. Right. But um, yeah. I mean, I just think we are we're a feasting culture. Like we just really think that we ought to be able to enjoy the best of everything whatever it is every every day because we're we're a pleasure culture you know the iphone culture like we just our brains are used to pleasure at all times and yeah. we're yeah uh you talk about food communicating love is there something to the idea of like it tastes better if it's made with love is that real yes okay. <laughs> yes i think it is help me understand i think it is true well like because I never I had the love of a good mother. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna read the bio. <laughs> Justin said he had read some some of some biographical material on yeah. you, so I'll I'll find that uh, out later, I guess. Yeah. But, um, I've whet your appetite. Yeah, right. To dig into the book, the buns <laughs> just keep coming. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so, um, oh, what, what did Sorry. you just say? Yeah, food made with love. Is it actually better? Yeah, so I I have gone over to a friend's house and have them made me make me a salad before and just realized like I think someone making me a salad is my love language. Like I think it actually macaroni about, or potato. 
<laughs> no. Oh, you mean a, <laughs> this was okay. in this case okay. it was a green salad. Oh, okay. But it was it was just someone else made it. They made it specially for me and it tasted so much better. It was just so much better than if I'd made it. But tell me about the joy of doing something poorly. Okay. So I am not a good cook. I think I've said a few different times by nature, I am not a great cook. I am a very absent minded person. Um, it was just a big joke growing up that no one, no one gave me cooking jobs to do in my house of seven kids because it was always smarter to give it to someone else. Um, so when we got married, I, I, I couldn't make very many things at all. Thankfully, I have a husband who is great, a grateful eater. That's how you, the only way you could describe Justin Delay is a grateful and enthusiastic eater who is so happy to have whatever you put in front of him. Um, so he just thinks, oh, she's such a great cook, you know, from day one. And I could make like chicken, you know, and that was it. Um, so a lot of, a lot of ladies don't know how to cook. You know, our mothers aren't aren't necessarily teaching us to cook in in this day and age. So, you kind of have to get get curious in order to learn. Um, but we also have more resources than you can imagine. Learning to cook more more ingredients available to us than you can imagine. So it's all there. It's just a matter of like having the time and the motive um, to learn. But you've got to be willing to mess up a lot, as I have. You know. And you got to be willing to not be the best at things because yeah. most of the people I know can cook even now better than I can. But Perfect is the enemy yeah. of good. Of good. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. Um, talk to us about being a wine mom, about one yes. o'clock. Yeah. I thought that was one of the most useful, practically pastorally useful sections in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a live issue, man. Even now that's a live issue because – you know, we're Baptist church um, in a in a small town. We we did not have any drinkers in the church probably 20 years ago. Um, and then you have kind of the new reformed group of guys with beards who like beer. And my husband's one of those guys, um, so he's he enjoys beer. And I, you know, I had drinking issues really when I was when I was having the food issues. I was having drinking issues too. So that was some baggage, you know, that I brought in. And um, I just started noticing right a little while after I had kids that there's like, an, there's like a, a meme culture with moms talking about wine. Like, thank goodness it's wine o'clock now because the kids, have, you know, driven me crazy all day. And it just being this big joke, like sometimes I drink in order to deal with motherhood. Um, so that's what I was writing, I think that's the reason why I wanted to write about yeah. that in the book. Cause it just felt like this is kind of a, a thing, you know, you did an interesting little thought experiment. You said, what, 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 how would we feel if our husbands spoke about our families like that in relation to beer, hmm. you know, it's beer o'clock or maybe yeah. that wasn't your thought experiment. Maybe. I do not remember okay, saying that. Okay. So then, sorry. Sounds <laughs> great. Uh, yeah. Maybe you should have had that in there, but I, here, <laughs> I think, I think we did that in our discussion just like, uh -huh. yeah, dad says, you know, it's five o'clock and man, just my family driving me crazy. I got to have a couple beers before I can like really enjoy the night. You yeah. Know? I think we'd, we'd, we'd be like, Hey man, that's not cool. Yeah. That's, that's off base. Yeah. Side note, it would be great. That's a great thought experiment for wives everywhere in all kinds of areas of life. If we were, if we demanded, like if, if our husbands were demanding things of us that we demand of our husbands publicly online all the time, that's just walk through that. If you ever, if you ever get a chance, keep walking there because that's yeah. a great experiment for women. Yeah. Equal, Side equal note, women. weights and measures. Yeah. 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 Just be fair. <laughs> just be fair. Um, but it is not legitimate for moms to talk about wine as like the therapy that gets them through their difficult life with kids. I know it's hard to be at home with with children, with small children. It is. It's hard work and it's exhausting and it's emotionally taxing and all those things. I get it. Um, but wine cannot be the answer. And if we talk about it publicly as if it is the answer as Christians, then we are, we are defaming the gospel. We are pretending like... Christ was not sufficient um, to get us through this season, you know. 
so that's I think that's what got me wanting to to write. But then also we have we have a mixture in our church of of abstainers and of imbibers. And um, I think I heard a helpful talk from Joe Rigney a few from a few years ago where he was talking about a continuum um, of basically legitimate positions as a Christian and illegitimate positions, and the illegitimate ones being people who think it's wrong to drink at all times in all places. Um, he he considered that to be not a legitimate Christian position based on the biblical text. I agree. Yeah. Um, but I do have, you know, I have dear friends who do not partake and who live alongside those who partake in a very gracious way, I would say. Yeah. So. so, Mom, feel free to have a glass of wine, maybe mm-hmm. even two, depending on how much you fill the glass. Depending on how much you weigh. That's right. And whether or not you had food we don't have beforehand, to talk about that. <laughs> what kind of wine it is. But do not talk about wine as if it is... Your savior. Yeah, that's right. I thought that was very, very useful, sister. Thank you. Um, Should we fast? Yes. Okay. Yes, we should. Okay. You're going to have to help me because I always struggle Mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. Convince me now. (laughs) Okay. Um, Read John Piper's I did. He convinced me already. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So do you not, when you're reading that book, hunger to fast like there is a real desire and a yearning for fasting i feel like reading when i'm in that book but do it do it so your food tastes better if for no other reason but because it does it's it's an incredible you know sharpener of appetite if that's that's a that's a great reason but um you know do, do it to lay something out before him do it to quiet, quiet in your mind. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a gift. The it benefits really are comprehensive. Mm-hmm. We're holistic beings. Mm-hmm. And if you fast the right way for the right reasons, mm-hmm. for the right reward, uh, I think, yes, spiritually it will be beneficial. And I don't think it's wrong also to expect to have emotional and physical benefits that go right along with that. Mm-hmm. Like when you come off of a fast, a dry biscuit tastes amazing. Right. You know, praise yeah. God for that. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it's a, pl- it's, it's a real pleasure. Yeah. Breaking a fast is a real pleasure in, you know, in life um, that you really can't get any other way. There's no other, just like you can't ever have the first bite again. You can never have that break, that true break mm-hmm. fast. Um, I've just breakthroughs in prayer, mm-hmm. breakthroughs in, um, in relational help, um, our elders recently were trying to think through a pretty big issue in our church and mm-hmm. I recommended, did not demand, but recommended mm-hmm. that they join me in fasting one day a week mm-hmm. to just say to God, like, I, uh, I want to know your will about this thing more than I want food. Mm-hmm. And for me, I want food a lot. So, mm-hmm. you so that's know. saying something. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's hard for us to want things very much. I just I do think that a lot of our desires and needs are dimmed are are dimmed by our um, probably by our phones as much as anything else. But um, I just think it is very difficult. You know the story about the who, which king was it that was supposed to ask for something and he didn't beat he didn't beat enough times with the with the the bundle of arrows or what was it? I'm, I'm, I don't know. This you is got terrible. Me. I should yeah, have started. Yeah, me too. I think I think that I had this even in the book possibly but um um the king who he he was he was told to pound on god's door and he did it half-heartedly and he was condemned for that because he did not ask hard and it is really hard for us to want anything even like the salvation of a of a beloved family member it is so hard for us to sustain our desires because we're so weak in our in our um, our ability to even focus on a thing for that long, and fasting can help with that. You know, it can help with just wanting a thing enough to ask for it, and uh, you know, enough. Garrett Kell makes a really good point on this when he talks about purity. He says, like, when when you learn to do things like fast, and you rein in those desires, and you exert godly discipline. You usually do it for like one narrow reason, but what you find is that 
it it kind of becomes comprehensive in your life. Like all of mm-hmm. a sudden you find more will and discipline in all these other areas too. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. you you remember these these appetites and these desire these spiritual appetites and desires that you had forgotten um, kind of become awakened again. Yeah. All right. I guess it's time for another fast. Talk to us about the the romance and disappointment of foreign cuisine. Oh yeah, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll always always some Lewis quote probably in, in every everything that I've ever written. Um, so he he talks about going to a foreign land and how when you go when you go somewhere it's romantic. You are um, you don't, you don't know the culture. So everything is new and exciting for you. And then at some point, if you ever go and settle there permanently, you have to deal with real life there and marriage being the same way you, you know, you, you kind of start thinking this one thing and then you, you have to settle down and actually get to know that person. Um, so I think I just wanted to write a chapter about that, about kind of the longings, the, the, the way that food for us sometimes represents this, longing for another land, this kind of desire for heaven. Um, the way that we talk about when we went to Italy and had that perfect meal and that perfect little hole, you know, it's part of the story that we tell about our travels. And it's part of the, it's part of the kind of exotic, I can never have that meal again kind of way that we talk about these things. And, um, I guess I just wanted to to connect that to the desire, the un, you know, the unfulfilled desire for for God Himself and for His heaven. Yeah. Um, we have a barbecue restaurant here in Decatur, world famous, world famous, most. won many awards. Uh, the guy who founded it invented Alabama white sauce. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Even I've so, heard of that. Yeah, pretty big deal. And uh, people here in Decatur are just kind of like blah about it. Hmm. There's a little bit of a barbecue rivalry in town between two different restaurants, Wits and Big Bob's. But visitors come and they're like, I got to try Big Bob's. Like, I'm so excited. Let's do Big Bob's. And Mm -hmm. when that happens, the locals are like, "Eh, you know, don't get your hopes up. There's nothing to write home about. Yeah. And that to me is the Italy thing. Familiarity, breeding contempt, basically. Mm -hmm. The people who are in Naples are not blown away by the mm-hmm. focaccia bread that they're eating every day. Right. Right. They're just like, this is bread. But mm-hmm. for you, it's this big thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's just, in, anyways, I thought like, oh, there's like the foreign travel seeking that food out. But then there's also like a local expression of that. It's like the reverse. It's the, we're not that impressed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And, but this, this definitely is another, I think it's another good piece of evidence to me that that food has this sort of cultural meaning and um, I don't know. We, I mean, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't, I don't think we should be as evangelistic and crazy about that as worldly people are because for them food is like, like it's like art. Food is the meaning of life. Art is the meaning of life. These are, these cultural things become kind of the worst, the object of worship. Um, You know, you would take a, you would go on a, on a, um, oh, what's it called? A pilgrimage, you know, to go see this, this thing or this show or this food from Naples. And it's okay for us to, to love and enjoy and to see the kind of mystery and delight that there is in some of these things. But as Christians, we should definitely recognize what that's all about. Like that is a stand in. And if you go to Naples and you do love what you try there, when you come back home, Rejoice in what you have there. Yes. Right? Because that's a gift from God too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You end your book by talking about the Lady Tower. Yeah. What's the Lady Tower? One of like five people who read the the epilogue. (laughs) People don't read forwards or epilogues. People don't. They don't. But they're usually my favorite parts of a book. Yeah, well, you're weird, but Uh go ahead. Right. (laughs) Um, So there's this tower in Hartsville that it's it's a nuclear cooling tower. Is that right? Nuclear? Is that the right word? Yeah, you okay. nailed it. I'm, as opposed I'm to nuclear. As as, I'm yeah. almost as good as George Bush um, at saying words. So it's a cooling tower. It's the size of a skyscraper out in the middle of farmland, just standing out there. And it's it was built in the 80s. They were going to start up a huge operation there. And I think 
just the the money didn't make sense. They it wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to financially make sense. Mm-hmm. They abandoned the work. Yeah. Um, so it's still it's still there. I keep thinking that someone should should buy that piece of land and and open like a a destination rock climbing tower because I would I feel like you should climb this thing because it looks like you should climb it. Um, but it's shaped like a like a corset, like it's shaped like this. And so we call it the Lady Tower in my house. Um, and at some point, it just occurred to me that it reminds me of a mon. It reminds me of the Tower of Babel, obviously, because mm. that's what it looks like. But um, it's just this work that somebody poured enormous amounts of energy and resources into that just got abandoned in the '80s at the drop of a hat. And that is what our bodies are going to be. We we w- women who I was talking to, I guess. Um, I, building, it resonated with me though right, just as much. Right. So if you if you are a man or a woman who builds who builds your life around your body, you are building a tower that's going to be abandoned when you die. It's going to be you're not going to be working on it anymore. No one else will either. So you know, just know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There's a lot more that could be said, sister, but now we're going to get into the most important questions of the interview, the rapid fire questions like tea or coffee. Oh, tea. Favorite sitcom. The office. There you go. I'm, I have to whisper that because I'm a pastor's wife. But that's right. Yeah. But Which office. is what she said. Oh, gosh. Okay. Now, if you could be trapped on an island with only the, the preaching of one of these men, uh, and I'm not going to put your husband in there on purpose. So you don't Why have to not? choose. So you don't have to choose. Yeah, of course he's the answer. You want all of Justin's sermons, but okay. you can't have him on this island. Then we'd be on an island together. You, it'd be awesome. It'd be amazing. But okay. that's not the way the cookie crumbles. All right. Another food pun. I am amazing. Dever, mm-hmm. Piper, Keller, Sproul, John MacArthur. You can only have one of their sermons on the island for the rest of your life. Who do you choose? Piper. Same question, but books. Does it have to be one of their books? Mm-hmm. Oh. All of their books. You can have all of Devers, all oh, of Piper's. The, oh, so it's their entire uh-huh, works. Uh-huh. Okay. All of John, and, John MacArthur. I wish I could have a Puritan. That would be nice. If I was on an island alone, I just feel like I would, I would need a lot of comfort. It sounds lonely. So Piper, again? I guess Piper. Yeah. Because he's just going to channel C.S. Lewis to you. Yeah, that's right. All right. You're on an island. You can only have the entire corpus of Tolkien or Lewis. Lewis. Easy choice, right? Favorite fiction author? Mm, Probably Jane Austen. Huge fan. Okay. Um, Second, George Eliot. Uh, big fan of what is he Elliot. what is he written it's a she actually uh, oh, the classic female george <laughs> yeah you know how it <laughs> that is that was sometimes. wild of me to not know that uh it was a pen name i'm pretty sure um what middle march is what i really like okay. by her whatever okay. mountains or beach mountains champagne or wine i don't know if i've ever legit had champagne that was like a, a good one yeah so probably just wine Favorite and least favorite candy? Oh, I hate candy corn so much. So bad, right? So, so much. Um, I have a piece of dark chocolate every day of my life. You're while such a I'm, mom. While I'm feeding, while I'm teaching <laughs> someone to chocolate. read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, everyone in my house, down to the, the two and three-year-olds, like 70, 72% dark chocolate, exactly. Like that is the percentage that everyone likes. Is that is that annoying? That's that's wild. <laughs> we like it. All right. With salt though. Ooh, smart move. Yeah. Panera has a kitchen sink cookie, which I think one bite makes you a glutton, mm-hmm. but they put uh, sea salt on top. Mm. And it's just, it's always the right move. So we have, a, we have a, a cookie that I make for our coffee shop. We opened a coffee shop last year with some friends in our town. And I make a salted toffee chocolate chip cookie every day for that shop. But it's like this big. Yeah. And I guess when you make them that much, you don't find yourself tempted to eat them. I don't want to cut into profits, man. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, Android or iPhone? iPhone. Macaroni salad or potato salad? Gross. Right. Foie gras? Wait, wait. Let me say that. Let me try that again. Foie gras Foo -foo or escargot? Escargo. Never had either. Which one would you be more interested in trying? Um, I think escargot because in It Takes Two with Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, I was told that it tastes like a balloon, and I really would like to know if that's true. That's a real throwback right there. It is. Wow. Uh, foie gras, fatty liver, you know, paste. Oh. Or it can be turned into a paste. It's actually one of the main ingredients of a banh mi, which is like a Vietnamese oh. sandwich with like pickled daikon. and. Never had that. It, it sounds is great. Amazing. Yeah. Because because instead of putting like a fatty base like mayonnaise, you put the fatty liver. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. It's like cooking with yeah. bacon grease or something. Yeah, a little bit. If there, If I could get more restaurants into, into Hartsville. If there was just a great Asian, some kind of Thai or something, anything, it would just be so great. But it would get a Panda sad. Express in there or something. Yeah. Uh, so. Night out or night in? In. Concert or football game? Concert for sure. I don't actually know the rules of football. Oh, okay. But again, in. Okay. <laughs> Morning person or night owl? Morning. Burger King or McDonald's? You have to choose. Yeah, McDonald's, I guess. Okay. Mexican or Italian? Italian. Uh, burgers or barbecue? Burgers. Chinese takeout or sushi? Sushi. Theonomy? Yes or no? Sad no. I'm not allowed to make statements on podcasts <laughs> about <laughs> theonomy. Your husband will my have husband to deal says, with. <laughs> my husband says I'm not allowed to talk about it because I don't understand it well enough to talk about it. He's right. I don't. Yeah. But I don't really like it. Yeah. Uh, this won't be controversial then. He won't have to deal with this question. This will be good. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Luke? Okay. What race is your least favorite? I already heard this joke Dang on it. your last <laughs> okay. podcast. And, and it was hilarious. <laughs> Thanks. But I'm not going to be taken in Okay. All right. Cold or hot? Um, what is the context that's mm -mm. really important? Just, you just got to take it from there. I would rather be hot than cold. Okay. If we're talking about temperatures outside. Rock or rap? Um, probably rap. Favorite movie? Probably The Princess Bride. Princess Sorry, Bride. is that annoying? Classical or jazz? Jazz. Uh, what hymn would you like to be sung at your funeral? Um, I think it would be really funny <laughs> when the roll is called up yonder. I think it would be a cute, I, I, a cute funeral familiar. song. When the roll is called up yonder. Oh, oh it's like such a like great like twangy, country. It's like a yeah. country hymn. But when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Okay. It's but a great that, funeral song. But you're thinking like that would be a good prank. When the roll is called up yonder. I love that song. Okay. And it would be great for a funeral. So okay. yes. All right. It so would be a little actually, funny though. So people, a little I think funny. people would giggle a little. Yeah. Also. Okay. I like that. I'm, yeah. I'm digging that. No one's ever asked me that question. Well, there you go. Well, th if you thought that question was a doozy, here you go. Last one. Last one. Best one. How many holes does a straw have? Two. What's the answer? What? <laughs> yeah. We got we got another person who doesn't understand how the concept of holes works. All right. Yeah, you have to either explain it or don't. Well, well let me you. ask you this. I mean, your wedding ring, does it have one hole or two? Okay, so it's one hole. Yeah. So a straw is one hole. Yeah. That's okay, what a well, straw there you is. Go. As long okay. as we got there, that's okay. fine. All right. <laughs> On that note, uh, let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you for my sister, Tilly. Thank you for giving her uh, not only the experience that led to this book, but also the gifting that allowed her to write this book. Uh, we pray that you will bless uh, this book to the glory of your name. Uh, we pray that many men and women will read it and profit from it, and that they will think well about how to consume and prepare and use food for the glory of your name and for the edification of your church. We pray all this in the beautiful, glorious name of Jesus Christ, the true bread of life. Amen. Mm -hmm.